And then I get locked up again for, um, yeah, my homeboy said, man, let's go. Let, let's go rob somebody today. Let's Harris. <laughs> let's Harris. None of these plans have <laughs> been thought That's out. the dumbest idea. And we caught a bus to go rob somebody. Oh, let's Harris. We had no car. Hey, listen. I I'm, should end this interview uh, right no, now. No, <laughs> I, I didn't have a frontal lobe, Jay. I didn't have no frontal lobe. What am I supposed to do without my frontal lobe? Yes, oh it my developed at 21? Yes, it developed at 21. So here I, am, here I am at 16 years old. I don't have a frontal lobe. So I go back to my, main, my, my home school, and it was around the Christmas holidays. We don't have no money. He said, man, let's go rob somebody. I said, let's go do it. I said, we can't do it in our hood. So we caught the bus all the way to Garland, and uh, we stood outside of this uh, convenience store, and we just picking people out. We was like, nah, let's rob them. And I was like, nah, she look like she got a family. I don't want to take her money. <laughs> and he said, well, rob- a robber with a heart. Oh, I, had, I had a big heart. I could <laughs> never rob people. I, I, I suck. I, that's why we never did fall. We never went through with the plan. <laughs> oh, my God. I kept saying, let's rob him. Nah, look at his car. He's like, he's barely making it. Nah, we're going to rob him. They need the money. Well, let's rob him. Well, nah, is he doing it? She got a baby. I'm going to rob it. Like, we, we was doing all this stuff. And um, so finally, this one guy came up to us. He was like, say, you know where, uh, where we can get some crack? Welcome to The Dash. You know, The Dash is that tiny line between your life start date and end date. It's your story. Chapters in your book, your journey. Your journey. Your journey. Get ready for real conversations with real people telling real stories about the realities of failure, setbacks, and success. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're rolling. Let's go. Dance in three, two, one. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Dash Podcast. I hope you've been using your Dash very well since the last time you checked us out. Matter of fact, you know what I want you to do? Do me a favor. If you haven't already, click subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your family, um, share this episode if you really love this episode. And if you've already subscribed, y'all, thank y'all so much. I'm so appreciative. You have no idea because this has definitely been a journey. Um, And today I'm going to talk about the journey because I have my behind the scenes producer. Um, He is a star in his own right. Um, Miss Lateris Whitfield with me today. Lateris R. Whitfield. <laughs> I, need you to, I need you to brand me properly, Jay. And then do y'all know this is he gets he is the thorn in my side. <laughs> <laughs> this man gets on my nerves. No, I'm just joking. No, seriously. Um, he has produced the Dash podcast this season. So, you know, when we switched up the sets or whatever, y'all were like, oh, it looked real nice and professional. <laughs> That's because uh Lateris was like oh, no, we can't do another season like your last season. So come on over here and I'm going to help you out. So, um, Lataris, first of all, I want you to tell everybody about your podcast. And then we'll kind of get into, you know. How it came to be. Yeah. Um, I'm the host of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. It's a podcast that I take viewers on my personal journey as I discover, uncover, and recover love. Um, I'm going to see if Jay can actually take me seriously when I talk about... Because y'all know on his his podcast, he be <laughs> sitting there writing letters and stuff, putting them in boxes. I'm always messing with him. Whenever he go to the grocery store, I'll be like, keep your eyes open. The lady you're supposed to get that box of letters might be in there. <laughs> I went and spoke at the event a couple of weeks ago, and you was like, hey, you may find your wifey there. <laughs> and I was like, the lady you're going to give all them letters to. Yeah, you just never know. Oh, Lord Jesus. But yeah, so I just decided to heal in front of the world. I said, I want to heal and allow people to to see the the wounds, to see the scars uh, on my hand and say, listen, we've all been there. We've all done things that we're not proud of. And I said, God, I'm just going to allow you to use me. Most, oh, it's so uncomfortable to be like that in front of the world, but yeah. it's been paying off very well because a lot of people have been getting healed. A lot of people. Yeah. Like, I'm going to toot, for the first time, I'm going to toot your horn. Oh, that's going to be great. Let me go ahead and sit back over here. (laughs) Yeah, toot, toot. Come on, let's toot. No, a lot of people. And I I give you a hard time because Lataris, I've known Lataris for (laughs) y'all for a long time. And I really am proud of you. I appreciate that. I'm proud of you and I'm proud of... I mean, really what has happened has kind of been unexpected because you started Dear Future Wifey during the pandemic, right? Yeah, two and a half years ago. And what did you think it was going to be? You know, I had no expectations. Like, the, originally, I started out writing a movie called Dear Future Wifey, 
And then I stopped. Well, actually, I wrote a movie called Dear Future Wife. And then it evolved into Dear Future Wifey uh, after coming into some trademark issues with with uh, a guy who became one of my closest friends, Bache, who owned the trademark for Dear Future Wife. And long story short, he ended up gifting me with that name wow. after the Dear Future Wifey uh, podcast started blowing up. He said, I see guys hand over your life. And... Um, I don't want to stand in the way of what God is doing. Now, Risley had reached out to me when I was writing those letters on Facebook. Called, you know, I would write, Dear Future Wife, and he said, man, you can't use that. He said, uh, and you're infringing upon my trademark. And I was like. <laughs> so he was checking you at yeah, first. <laughs> I was like, say, man. I was like, man, I'm just writing letters. I'm not, you know, he was like, uh, still, you can't, you can't do that. And I was like. Well, forget it then. I'm going to go ahead and change it to Dear Future Wifey. So when the podcast came around, I called it Dear Future Wifey. And then he had been checking me out. And he was like, I see God's hand over your life. I mean, God was just doing a lot of amazing stuff along the way. And, I mean, he literally gifted me with his trademark. How do you, how do you wake up one day and say, I want to heal in front of the world? That's bananas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually crazy, to be honest with you. But it was... I just I reached such a low moment in my life where I was literally looking for direction. I said, God, you know, um, I hear all these people in this relationship space. I said, I'm not them. I, I don't want to have a podcast where I'm telling everybody this is a solution because I didn't have any solutions. I'm trying to figure it out. And then God said, do exactly that. I was like, but how would people find value in that? I mean, literally watch me try to figure it out. He said, exactly. I said, well, that. Okay, but at least I need to start off each episode with a big quote. Like, I love the TV series Criminal Minds, and it will always start off with a quote, and I love quotes. So I said, I'm going to start off with that. He said, you're doing too much. Just just, just uh, do always. it. Yeah, I got to do a little. I got, to, I got to put something on it. And he said, do what you were doing. Write a letter after each episode like you were doing on Facebook. And at that time, I had written probably about five letters. He said, do that. And I was like... And then I had this one friend, which a mutual friend, she hates when I bring this up, so I ain't gonna say her name. But I had this one one friend that uh, a mutual friend of ours that said, Latarius, I gotta tell you something. That's corny for you to be writing these letters on Facebook. You know? Did that friend be me? No, it wasn't even you. Oh, because I was you like- said you said it was corny too. But yo, 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 you know, Summer, Summer was saying Summer got oh, this. Summer yeah. said we kind of think alike yeah, when it comes y'all to think that. Alike. Yeah. They were like, she was like, that's corny, Latarius. I, I mean, nobody ain't gonna tell you that, but that's 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 really corny. <laughs> and I was like. Man, how you gonna tell me what's going? This is this is my heart, and that's what I mean by actually being submitted, being authentically who you are. Because authentically, that's just who I am. No, I'm a writer. It, let me say this because for anybody who does want to second guess if this is who you are, this is absolutely <laughs> who Latera's wakes up and is every single morning. I always tell him, boy, you go in the world with rose colored glasses on. <laughs> Every every corner, his wife is there. Every you know, like she's not there. It's just that well, you I believe, visualize yes. that I, I'll wait the day that I meet her because I say if I was able to accomplish all of this on my own when I get my rib, it's gonna be something on a different level. You know, I know what I know what she brings into my life. She feels she covers my blind spots. She feels my deficiencies, and so that's what I'm. I get excited about that. Can I ask you a question? And I'm not being a naysayer, so please, because yeah. I know, look, I know how your audience is. I don't well, want them to be well, like, every time you said something, she had, because I'm, I'm really being positive. Are your expectations about a wife realistic? 100%. Because God gave it to me. See, God said, I will grant you the desires of your heart. So the desires, not that you come up with an idea and he says, that's what you want. I'm going to get it to you. But he literally plants the seed of that desire. And so if it wasn't real, I wouldn't be able to sit across the couch from other people who I see that with. I'll see people on my podcast that I could feel something from them. It was an episode that I did. Uh, um, and that couple... Even Bache and his wife, I'll sit there and talk to him. And I'm like, God, that's that's what I'm talking about. I wanna, I want somebody that goes from friend to fiance, and their whole dating thing. I would say this often, and then I have friends be like, Well, how do you expect that to happen? Well, then a couple episodes later, Bache, the one who gifted me with the trademark, I saw that they were literally friends, and then they were straight platonic friends, and then they started dating, but they were dating, they weren't dating exclusively, and that's how I feel that that's how me and my wife are gonna come into uh, alignment. Is that you date who you date? I date who I date and then when God says all right that's the one then we become the one um but I'll see it every little moment that I have in visualizing 
and visualizing my wife, I'll see an actual physical couple on my podcast that represents that. And I literally, in those episodes, I get extremely emotional. There's times where I just started just, just, just crying because I was like, that's, that's what I want. But sometimes even even when you're interviewing, don't you think that sometimes they're giving you the snapshot of the great? I think that people are always giving you fragments of it, but the essence and the core of who they are gotcha. always shines through. And that's what I want. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for alignment. And so um, been married before. Married yeah. almost, uh, what, two weeks shy of 10 years. So I'm never looking for perfection. I'm looking for alignment. And what I mean by that is where we're both clear in who we are in each other's lives. We're on the same team. We're not competing with each other. We acknowledge our own weaknesses. We acknowledge our own strengths and say, you know what? You're better at this than I am. You do that. That's good. You know what I'm saying? And I'm better at this. Let me do that. And we work like that together. Oh, we work in tandem. It's, it's, it's an unstoppable thing. And that's when you see couples and you go, that's a power couple. Yeah. It's because they're operating in their strengths. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's couples I see where, for instance, I'm going to bring Bache up again. Bache, he didn't like fashion. He wasn't a dresser. He, he was, uh, the girl Tara was his was his marketing person. So she started marketing him. She was like, we got to clean up your image. We got to get you looking better. Now you see Bache, he Gucci belt, Gucci suit. <laughs> I mean, he clean. You know what I'm saying? She upgraded she him. She upgraded him. She said, let me do that for you. You do this. And then it's, they're working so well together. And that's what I mean by you having purpose partners. Oftentimes, I don't call it a wife anymore. I say, I want my purpose partner. Mm. So whatever purpose that God planted in her heart and the purpose that God gave me, then together we just we fulfill God's purpose. And that's when... That's what I believe causes divorce when people don't understand the purpose of them being together. Yeah. Because if you don't even understand the purpose, there's no you, you're never going to get through the for better or for worse. Yeah. You're never going to get through the sickness and health. Right. I've had people that I've interviewed and people I know whose spouses left them when they were battling ca cancer. Like, like, how do you do that? It's like they just be like, I can't deal with it. And they'll leave. And then that person becomes after they after they beat cancer, then they're thriving, they become multi-millionaires, and then that person leaving them becomes a part of the story. They go, yeah, my husband left me while I was in the hospital. And you're like, what? And then they have an, a story of being able to overcome that situation, and now their spouse becomes the negative part in that story versus I was going through cancer, and my husband never left me. It's a couple called the Valentines that I plan on getting on my podcast, and I watch him love his wife through cancer. Ooh. And I just see it on Instagram, and I'll be like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's the sickness and then health. You know, but when you understand the purpose, you go, I can't, I can't leave my spouse when we're going through an argument or just because we had a disagreement or just because she went and bought some some shoes or a purse that she didn't tell me about. And I'm like, I'm going to divorce you because you I can't trust you. I mean, come on. that's You got to be able to come, overcome some stuff. Well, let me ask you this. Where do you get this insight from? Because most of us have never been taught relationships properly. So most of us get into a relationship because it's based on feeling facts, right? And feelings don't last. Feelings will fail you every single time. Love is an action, not a, an emotion, yes. not a feeling. But how did you gain this wisdom and this insight? Because I mean, obviously you failed at relationships yes. before. Um, how do you know now? In the failure. When I look back, I'm a, I'm a boy. When I say I'm, I'm, I'm extremely self-aware. So I look back and go, where did I go wrong? We can always point at what this person didn't do right in the marriage or whatnot. But I looked at some things in the past marriage and I said, I didn't do that right. I mm -hmm. want to fix that. I can't continue doing the same mistakes over again, expecting a different result. Uh, that's called insanity. And so I said, I don't, I don't want to be that. And I said, I looked at some things and I said, I want to fix that. There's some things that, and if we look at, there's common threads that we have in relationships, whether it was in our dating relationships, uh, failed uh, engagements or even marriage, you look back and go, the common denominator that people had a problem with me about, they always complained about this about me. If you're not self-aware, you'd be like, all them got issues. But then the day, how everybody going to be right about you? You the common yeah, denominator. Yeah, you the common denominator. <laughs> Deal with that so you can be better. And so I'm one of those type of people I've looked at my life and I said, I really want to be better. And I want to know what it feels like to do life with a person and get all the way till death do we part. I love that notebook kind of love, that love that 
I say that the Titanic. You, oh man, I'm telling you. <laughs> already know, already know. Yeah, because it's true. It's like you can become so one with somebody that when you die, they die because y'all's hearts were tethered to each other. I actually knew a person who um, whose mother passed away, and eight days later, his father passed away from a broken heart. That is that is a connection that. I mean, I clearly never experienced. But they call it, it is, a broken heart, and yeah. I don't think it's a broken heart. I think it's oneness. So even when I talk, talked about that, it's not that your heart is broken. You become one with each other. So, I, so see, the Bible is very clear when it says that the two shall become one. We say that. We don't know what that means. If, if you die... And you're one. You yeah. can't. You can't, you can't live. You can't live, you can't live without the because yeah. it's part of the one. It's the one. Okay. So, so that's what I truly feel. I'll be like the two. The Bible says a man shall leave his uh, his mother and father, and a woman shall leave his mother and father and cleave to one another. That cleaving process is like this. It's a tethering process. So then, if y'all are that close to each other, and y'all's heart beat on the same rhythm, that when that when one person's heart stops, that's why you see the other person die shortly after. That's good. Yeah, that's okay. what I believe. Okay, so you know we're on the dash. Yes. And the dash is all about the journey, talking about your story, how we got to this point. Yes. So I want to go all the way back. Uh-oh, how far are we going? I want to go back to the hood, Latera. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Lord. People don't know that part, Jay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we know you, Dr. Love. We, we, we get all that, okay? Yes. Um, they get to see that weekly on your podcast. Yes. But I think people will be surprised to know that some of you've overcome so much, oh, Lateris. Yeah. Um because you seem so polished. <laughs> you know, you're so nice now. <laughs> but y'all, Lateris was a gangster, okay? I was a wannabe gangster. Yes. Okay, so let, let's go back to who is little Lateris? Little Lateris was this young boy growing up in Pleasant Grove, um, trying to figure his way at, around life. Father was, I used to say, my father had this unique ability about being present and absent at the same time. Uh, he was in the house, but not of the house. Um, and that was deep. He was in the house, but not of the house. Okay, it's yeah. like being in the world and not, not of, of the, the world. world. I'm trying to tell you, he was there, but he just wasn't there. You know? <laughs> it's true. And so uh, I was always wanting the the love of my father and whatnot and wanted to spend time, and I cherished every moment that we would spend time together. He would take me roofing when he had little side jobs and would put uh, shingles on uh, people's houses, and I'd be up there sweating in the in the summer. Uh, <laughs> loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, but I was always like, I grew up in the hood. We grew up poor, uh, got evicted several times out of different places that we lived in, lived literally two houses down from the projects. Uh, grew up in Pleasant Grove, and there was these big old projects before I even knew they were projects that we just called them apartments, mm -hmm. but it's called Georgetown Village. Mm -hmm. And Georgetown was the hood. That's where all my friends were, but they used to look up to me because I literally live like two houses from the hood. And they're like, he live in the house. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But it makes a difference no, though makes, when you're young. It makes a huge difference. Like he live in the house. Yeah. He got his mama and daddy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they, they grew up without their, their father in the house. Um, but I never felt like I was privileged of any, you know, I was just like, we, we, we all struggling around here and we did, uh, grew up water getting cut off, you know, lights getting cut off. It, and that was just a way of life. And I look back over those things. Like even when we were going through the snow apocalypse, I will always go back to that moment. Cause when my son's like, what, what are we going to do? I was like, man, this is normal. We overtaking what they call whore bass. Get a uh, uh, get a tub of hot water. It ain't called whore bass. It's called whore bass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be very proper. Uh, clearly. We're going to call it a whore bath. <laughs> <laughs> so a floozy bath. <laughs> a floozy bath. A Jezebel, Jezebel. Bath, bath, bath. We took a Jezebel bath. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we were stand, I was standing. I was like, this is what you got to do. Stay in the tub and you're washing yourself off. And so, but it was those Oh, y'all didn't even do it at the sink? Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, yeah, y'all was, oh, excuse yeah. me, that was a horror. Man. That was a little upgrade. You, you, you the sink, you the sink, oh, yeah. Stand on the towel. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's where I grew up. And so I always grew up poor, always trying to get it. Uh, but I was always uh, intuitive in the way that, so I always wanted, my mom never bought us name brand shoes. We never had anything. We had those uh, 
XJ 900s. Oh, snap. From Payless. Yeah. XJ 900s. Those are shoes that were lookalikes to whatever the top shoe was. <laughs> you know, you're going to have you some dope man Nikes, but they're going to have XJ 900s on it. Be that. <laughs> you know, it's going to have all that with it. And so that's what I grew up wearing those soles come to detach from the shoe because of the rainwater slip. slip. I mean, it's, that was my world. But I always wanted nicer stuff. And so my homeboys used to always go in the store and steal all the time. And I, my mom would always make home-cooked meals. So I would trade my food for them stealing shoes, them stealing shirts and all that stuff because the, the, the clothing store was right down the street. It was literally about about two blocks down the street. And so they'll walk over there and they were, uh, it was a Sears outlet and they would put something in their pants, come on out, put in their coat, come on out. And, and they'll How come to my your house. Your mom wasn't asking you, where are you getting this stuff from? <sighs> I don't think she wanted to know. I, I really don't think, because I know my mom ain't crazy. Because now looking back. Oh yeah, I would have shoot Nikes on or whatever and, I don't know what I used to tell my mom. Oh, I know what. Because I used to also have a side hustle where I would cut hair. So I was a, I was the hood barber. And so my mom didn't Hold know up. how much shoes cost. You were the hood barber? Hey, don't judge me you, by my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, <laughs> don't get high off your own supply. And so, <laughs> and, so, and so I used to cut hair in the, in the hood. And I was an artist, so I could draw uh, spades in the back of your head and all that type of stuff. And the Playboy bunny rabbit cut in the back of your head. So I used to do all that stuff. And so then my brother... Uh, who I ain't seen in about 20 years, uh, he used to have a fascination with guns. Mm -hmm. And he would, we both got our first jobs at Bonanza Steakhouse. And he saved up his money one day, bought a gun. And he was playing in the bathroom with the gun and shot the, the mirror out. And he had dropped out of school around that time. And he said, man, if dad find out about this, he going to take my gun. So take it to school and sell it. So I took this gun up to Skyline High School. And I was like showing it to people like, hey, you want to buy this? You know, $50. How old were you? I was 16. How old was he when he told you to do this? About 18, 18, 19. Like, it wasn't even a smart plan. But it seemed like a smart plan when At you don't have time, your frontal lobe. Yeah. You don't have your frontal lobe ain't developing. So reasoning, <laughs> reasoning just, hey, my dad was like, I'll tell you that later. Okay. But I was like, so I went up there and I was going to sell it or whatever. Um, it was in 1994. I wrote a rap, rap about it. You want to hear it? Here it go. It says, you know, when, you, when you're in the hood, you got to write a rap about all your little stories. So I said, February 11, 1994, I brought a gun to school what wasn't stole. I didn't know brought the tray eight to school for a sale, selling my own life short because I'll be making bail. How could you get caught at a school of 3,000 students? But when it happened, teachers wonder why did I do this? And that's the part I still, that's the only part I remember. <laughs> but, 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 but that was the rap that I wrote back oh in the day. Gosh. That's when you actually get street cred. When you get locked up, you have to make a rap rap about it so I you know I was a fish so I was street credit fish there stop no okay, you got so, to that's that's how you grew up okay. so you had to write a rap about the about the journey Tupac was doing it so, so I had to do uh, clearly the same thing. according to the rap you ended up going to jail I ended up going to jail I got you got uh, caught at school got caught at school um last period of the day um Mr. Abercrombie God rest his soul he ended up uh snitching on me and youth action came and got me and they uh took me to jail and they, I was only able to go to the holding tank at that time. And then my dad got me. He was like, how stupid can you be taking a gun to a government facility? And I was like, government facility? I ain't taking it to a government facility. He says, a school. He said, a school is a government facility. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I never I never thought about that. Yeah. And so uh, my dad was a type. You get your you get yourself in trouble. You got to get yourself out. So I had to. I was on probation. I was literally like, first of all, I got kicked out of the program I was in at the school. I was in the graphic design program at Skyline, mm. and then I was sent to my uh, my home school, which is Samuel High School. And so I was going there, and I was on probation. And um, you thought you was tough, didn't you? Man, I did, but I, I no, I, I never liked to be bad. You know what I'm saying? It was like. I like to get away with. It. I don't want to be looked at as the bad because I always felt like that you was didn't ignorant. Want the label. Yeah, I'm like I don't sure. be ignorant. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like what you did this because it wasn't nothing to be proud of. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was always like, God, that's so stupid. Because my dad said I was stupid. He was like, Why would you do that? That's stupid. So um, I went to um, alternative school, but that's when I found my my purpose. I went to alternative school, and they said, you know what? Our youth are going through so much stuff. Let's go ahead and write a play about it. So they chose about 12 of us, and we wrote this play called Real Life. It was sponsored by DISD, 
and um, um, Bank of America. Oh, that's cool. And it was so dope. And we did this one act play, uh, black box theater, where it's not a whole bunch of sets and nothing. It's just black box and straight theater. And gang members was in it because they were at the school. The school is called Lacey. It was a pilot program uh, off of South Beckley in Dallas. Uh, and Lacey was the acronym that stood for Learning Alternative Center for Expelled Youth. And so they had us there. Back in those days, we could have, you know, it was free dress. But then at Lacey, we had to wear, we couldn't wear shorts. We had to have, you know, jeans on. We had to tuck our shirts in with belts and all that stuff. And I was like, man, we walking around here lame. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was just, it was just, it, it was crazy. funny when you look back over life, like, Something as simple as tucking your shirt oh, in was so corny. You, yeah, like, you can't tuck your shirt in and go to school. You know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> yeah. like, you sure can't walk around sagging and stuff like people are doing. And so I started learning a whole lot about accountability because they, Mr. Richard Davis, who's still my mentor to this very day, held me accountable. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely strict. Mm -hmm. extremely strict and anything that you wanted, extra privileges, you had to earn it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it taught me how to use my greatest form of communication, which is writing. And one day I ended up writing a letter to him and said the rope, because he used to always say, I'm tightening up the rope. I'm tightening up the rope. That means that he's about to crack down and make stuff even harder. And then one day I wrote this letter to him. I said, the rope is too tight. And then I had a a, a, a guy hanging on a clock and, it, and, and there was a noose around his neck. And I said, time is running out. I said, the, the rope is too tight. And I, and I began to negotiate. I said, listen, um, it's hot during these the, the, <laughs> in the month of May. Um, we would like for you to give us the opportunity to wear shorts just for the last week of the school year. And I said, we'll make sure we still tuck our shirts in. And, and at any point where there's a disturbance or we start acting rowdy, then we'll go back to whatever it is. And I said, would you please allow us this? And he wrote on that paper, granted. I still got that letter to this very day. What? Because it taught me that if you communicate properly, you can have the desires of your heart. And he wrote, granted. And we ended up doing that one act play, um, and it changed my life because I watched the power of the written word. And I never knew at that time God was planting a seed in my heart to actually become a national touring playwright. So a lot of people don't hold know that on, stage of my life. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. I'm going to skip because we got to get on the playwright thing, but yeah. I'm going to skip. You, you, you said, okay. Mm. Woo. If you communicate properly, God will give you the desires of your heart because you made the request plain yes. and clear to your teacher. Do you realize, and you do, but I'm just saying, it's the funny correlation. See, you went to playwright, but I'm going to now. You were speaking mm. the vision clear in your communication, in your letters, about the wife and the characteristics that you want. Facts. So here we go. Little Latares. Yep. 16 learn, years learn old. Learn the lesson at 16. And that same lesson, you're applying it because you're you're making the vision very clear. Very clear. Wow, Latares. That is, um, and that's why I wanted to skip over the playwright and you being a, a filmmaker because Golly, when we look back over our life. For I know all things work together for the for good, good of them that love God listen. and to the call according to his purpose. And that's what we got to really understand. Because even in that moment, uh, and I love what I was doing there because, I, it, like I said, the school had about 50 students. They chose about 12 of us to do this play. And we wrote the play. They had a dramaturg. Uh, David, he, he he oversaw the project, and David Marquis, who became another one of my mentors to this very day. Um, um, he's a white guy, and then I had this black guy, so I had this best of both worlds teaching me and grooming me, and um, I mean, just amazing men. And I literally was like, you know what? I could actually communicate. You know, I can actually use words to, to affect people, because in that audience, People were crying in the audience. It was like, oh, my God, I know these kids were going through this stuff. And the play was about uh, two two rival gangs. But they, 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 were, they were two rival gangs, but you got a chance to see that each one of these gang members actually had dreams. They really didn't want to be killing each other. They really didn't mm -hmm. want to be fighting all the time. It's just that based on their environment, that's all they knew. But deep down inside, they wanted more, which is the same thing that happens across hoods all across America. People don't want to just hurt nobody. They really don't be like, I just want to kill somebody today because I ain't got nothing else to do. If that was the case, it'd be people dying like literally every minute. Everybody, everybody running second. around just killing everybody. Yeah, 
Sure. Like, it just don't make sense. They really want something better. They just don't know the way out. And so that's what the play was about. And uh, it was called Real Life, and it touched a lot of people's lives. The play actually became a published play. And so then I go back into my main school after I completed that year, and then I get locked up again for, uh, yeah, my homeboy said, man, let's go let, let's go rob somebody today. Let's Harris. <laughs> let's Harris. None of these plans <laughs> have been thought out. That's the dumbest idea. And we caught a bus to go rob somebody. Oh, let's we had no car. Hey, listen. I should the, end this interview uh, right no, now. No, <laughs> I, I didn't have a frontal lobe, Jay. I didn't have no frontal lobe. What am I supposed to do without my frontal lobe? Yeah, oh it my develops at 21? Yes, it develops at 21. So here I, am, here I am at 16 years old. I don't have a frontal lobe. So I go back to my, main, my, my home school, and it was around the Christmas holidays. We don't have no money. He said, man, let's go rob somebody. I said, let's go do it. I said, we can't do it in our hood. So we caught the bus all the way to Garland, and uh, we stood outside of this uh, convenience store, and we just picking people out. We was like, nah, let's rob them. And I was like, nah, she look like she got a family. I don't want to take her money. <laughs> and he said, we rob- a, a robber with a heart. Oh, I, had, I had a big heart. I could <laughs> never rob people. I, I, I suck. I, that's why we never did fall. We never went through with the plan. <laughs> oh, my God. Is- I kept saying, let's rob him. Nah, look at his car. He's like, he's barely making it. Nah, we're going to rob They need the money. <laughs> let's rob him. Well, nah, is he doing it? She got a baby. I'm going to rob it. Like, we was, we was doing all this stuff. And um, so finally, this one guy came up to us. He was like, say, you know where, uh, where we can get some crack? And I said. Some crack? Yeah, he wanted some crack. Y'all were clearly not what's supposed to be in front of this store. Uh, man, because we, we had them, you know, them starter jackets on, you know what I'm saying? And so the dude was like, you know. And I said, yeah, uh, but it's over there on our side of town. You know, and he was like, where y'all live? And I said, in Pleasant Grove. He said, we can, we can take you over there. So he's like, cool, get in the car. So we got in the car. I had a Tech Nine. I had a Tech Nine machine gun under my jacket. Wait, and hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Where did you get a Tech Nine? My brother. Machine? My brother always bought guns. My brother. Did he know you have it? Did yeah, he? yeah. Because I was gonna go. Did he know? Probably didn't. I think he did. He probably let me loan it. I don't know. You had a Tech Nine. I had a Tech Nine machine gun. I used to. All, I could take guns apart, put them back together, and all that. It was like I just. You had a tech nine. Jade, you got me going back here. You got me over here talking about my hood days. So you, you gonna I get mean, this work? Like, I didn't think it was gonna get that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a tech nine. I got yeah. So yeah. y'all got into the car with this guy. Got in the car with the Did guy. Did your friend have a gun? No, nah, he didn't have a gun. Of course. So it was his idea, but you yeah, the dummy that's gonna, gonna have to be the shooter. I'm gonna have a gun. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. But I was gonna shoot nobody. I know you weren't gonna shoot. I was but I'm gonna just scare saying. Him and say, give me some money. Yes, but <laughs> you were gonna get charged with. Oh, so I've aggravated assault with, with a deadly, deadly weapon. weapon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know all them offenses. I was gonna say, give me the money, and I ain't gonna hurt you. As a matter of fact, I was gonna say I had the line because I heard in the movie it say money or murder. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> that was my script. Money or murder, fool. Break yourself. That's what I was gonna do. Break yourself, fool. That's what I was gonna do. <laughs> Oh my gosh, money. this whole plan is a disaster. Okay. Hey, this is real. Oh money or murder. Gosh. That's why I saw money the movie. Money or murder. That's what it okay, was. Okay, so you get And they're going to give me the money and then we're going to Who go. knew that dear future wifey? <laughs> okay. And so, and so we get in the car. We're going down I, I, I-30 and the police pulls us over. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I take the gun. I slide it up under the uh, the passenger seat. And, um, and the police come. They run the guy's record. Um, he had uh, outstanding DWI, and he was dr- he was drunk that day driving. His speedometer wasn't working, um, and so that's how he didn't know what he was you know the speed limit he was going. My homeboy, they was about to book him because he had an outstanding uh, assault. He had a fight at school that he never did. Go look at the you know <laughs> finalize the ticket and all that stuff. First of all, y'all done got into a car with a crackhead. Crack, yeah. He is looking for crack. Yes, yes, and he's drunk. Drunk. Okay, and then, okay, so then you, both of them going to jail, so they went about so you. So I was free. Say. I'm standing up there. They was like, well, listen, uh, you're free to go, but uh, we're going to lock this car up, and uh, you're going to have to call somebody to get you. Of course, you don't have no cell phones or nothing. He said, we got to find somewhere to go. And I was like, all right, thank you, officer. And the guy said, he said, holy smoke. He pulled out the gun, and I looked at it like, where where that come? What is that? <laughs> you know, and they was like, they was like um, the officer was like, Where'd you get that from? He said, right by his feet up on the seat. I said, no, nah, I don't even, that wasn't by my feet. I said, I don't even know what that is. And, they, and then they was like, um, told me to turn around, put your hands on the car. I said, hold on, how you going to charge me? How you going to charge me because you found a gun in somebody else's car? This ain't my car. You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can be held against you in the court of law. And they charged me to UCW, which is unlawful carrying of a weapon. That's when I learned that if a gun or any type of weapon is within so many feet away from your possession, you get charged with it. 
And I was like, and they was like, that's why they said it was by my feet. Because if I could actually grab it, then who do who do we charge? And so they charged me with it. And wow. I was like, God, no. Nah. So here I am in jail. I'm in, in, the, in the mesquite jail sitting there like, oh, my God, this is a whole problem. Dad, come get me again. Like, this is this is fool. I know. He just wants to uh, smack He you. just thought I was just the dumbest person <laughs> in the world. I was like, but then there I was on probation. You know what I'm saying? I was on 16. probation. 16 years old. And at that time, it got real serious because I was just like, I got to I gotta do something different. Uh, um, yeah. It was, it was actually closer to about 17 because I knew that I was about to turn 18 and at the end of that. Whatever, as, an adult. as an adult. So I was like, it was the, it was the, the December that winter break and I turned 18 in March. And so I was like, please keep that on my juvenile record. And then I had a daughter on the way. And so my daughter was my, my, the mother of my child was pregnant my senior year in high school. And that's when I said, I can't, I can't do this. I can't be one of those dudes that's, my daughter is visiting in jail. And that was my wake-up call. Wow. And I said, I'm never going to be in this situation again. And I literally, I had two jobs. I worked at Blockbuster and Taco Bell. Shout and out to Blockbuster. Blockbuster. Oh, so you were one of the ones that used to find us for not rewinding. <laughs> yes, sure would. Be like, rewind your tape. Because I got to oh keep putting gosh, in the machine and rewind all the time. <laughs> yeah, you will find, you will get fined if you don't rewind. Facts. <laughs> and that's what we did. So I did that. And then I was working at Taco Bell. Both of those jobs was literally about a block away from each other. And then when uh, uh end up leaving Taco Bell, and then I was working at Blockbuster and Bonanza Steakhouse. Again, it was one on the north end of Buckner, and I would catch the bus uh, back and forth. But I had two jobs my senior year in high school, uh, having a daughter on the way, and my daughter was born two weeks before I graduated high school. Wow. And I said, time to man up. Time to man up. And so that December of 1996, I went and gave my life to Christ at the Inspiring Body of Christ Church off of, uh, wow. off of South Buckner, Pastor wow. Ricky G. Rush, and ended up going down there with my daughter in my arms and said, you know what, I can't, I can't live like this. And I said, God, I don't, I don't know what a father truly is. I have one that's present and absent, so I'm going to surrender myself to the, to the father of all fathers. And uh, that's when I really, really started chasing the heart of God. Now, I grew up in church. Um, was on Bible quiz tournaments and that type stuff, but that that adult that adult Jesus that I needed that was a different level, and that's what started shaping me to become who I am today. So you you thought you were going to be a pastor? Yes, I was going to go to Divinity School at Christwood Nation Church, and um, with a chain of events uh, that didn't work out. I uh, needed a recommendation letter, and um, that wasn't signed from my pastor. And so I end up. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Uh, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't. Um, we don't have to name names, but you needed a. <laughs> oh, you know this about the Christians. He we drinks about to talk about somebody passed mm -hmm. He drinking it like it's liquor in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some good old, Please. good old bottom one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you needed a recommendation letter signed by your pastor. Did your pastor think that you weren't? No, he just didn't think at all. He was just like, he just wasn't going to do it for whatever reason. I don't even know what was in his head. Later, wrong, and uh, years later, about 10 years later, he apologized. He apologized for always standing in the way of the hand of God on my life. That's why I say it's interesting, and that just hit me just now. He apologized for the same thing that Bache wanted to prevent. So put it like this. He said... I apologize for trying to get in the way of God's hand over your life. Bashe came, gave me my, his trademark, and said, I, I see God's hand over your life, and I don't want to get in the way of it. That wow. just hit me just now. And I was just like, wow. And I said, bro, what makes you do that? Even his friends was like, you going to just give him your trademark? You done wrote a book about it? You done did this? He said, oh, I see God's hand over his life. He said, either I get in his way and get run over, Ooh. or I get out of his way. And literally become friends with this dude. That's mm. why I said I love that dude. Like, 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 by Shay is my that, dude. That takes a man of character. A man of straight character. Because for him to say that, I was just like, but it's led me to tears because I've been asking God to heal me from brotherhood, like to bring good brothers in my life um, that that would really cover me because I felt like there's been a huge imbalance in my life. I have a whole lot of female friends and not many male friends. And so in 2020, I said, God, bring men into my life. Bring some men into my life so we can form some brotherhood. That's good, Latarius. Yeah. That's good. So 
earlier you mentioned being a playwright. A lot of this may not, a lot of people may not know this part right. about you. Um, you did national tours. Yes. Um, and you've worked with some really big names. Look, we on a dash. You know, we named, we, we, we named drop around here. So let's talk about some of the people that you've worked with. Tashina, Tashina Arnold, Tisha Campbell, Guy Torrey, Dave Hollister, Angie Stone wrote a show for Judge Greg Mathis, produced a show for him, Raph Trasvan, uh, Shirley Murdoch, uh, Darren Henson, Casey and JoJo. Um, I feel like I'm leaving a lot we of folks off. We need on the side of this have yeah, all the these names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scrolling all through or whatever. Yes. But yeah, just a, just a t Kim Fields. I can't leave off legendary uh, Kim Fields. Um, but yeah, I just worked with a whole lot of amazing talent, and I st I became a national playwright at the age of twenty four. Wow! At twenty four years old. So you were like, when we say national playwright, I want everybody to put it into perspective because we assume that people understand what that means, right? So like Tyler Perry is Tyler a national Perry. playwright, right? Right. So you were on your way to being like a Tyler Perry, right? I did about six, six or seven national plays. Um, shows were gross, uh, upwards of a million dollars. Um, one of my big shows, What Men Don't Tell, grossed 16 point something million dollars in the two and a half years that it toured. Uh, of course, I didn't get uh, most of that money. The, the promoter got most of the money. Oh, because I was like, wait, Oh, no, what? if I had 16, boy, I'm telling you, I still He was like, I wouldn't be on the dash. I wouldn't be right on the dash. I, I, dash yeah. would be in Turks and Caicos somewhere. <laughs> Turks and Caicos. Y'all going to meet me on the island somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But no, it was, um, but I did make good money. I mean, when I was touring shows, I was making on the average of anywhere from $6,000 to my biggest check I ever made was $24,000 in one week. So it was based upon, I always did my contracts on a commission scale. So if the show didn't make money, I don't believe that that the promoter should have to pay me anything. He's yeah. putting all his money out there. And um, But one thing that I understood is the power of a name. And I told my promoter, I said, listen, pay me whatever you want to pay me. It's going to be more than I've ever made in my life anyway. I said, but remember, what you pay me, you'll never pay me again because I'm going to use you to make my name great. Because guess what? Yesterday's price is not, is not today's, today's price. price. And I told him that at 24. And I said, but this is what I want my contract to have on everything my name is going to be on there. On the ticket, on the posters, on the in on the radio spots. They got to be mentioned about three times. On the TV spots, it's going to be on the flyers, on the playbill. I want my name on everything mm -hmm. because I knew the power of a name. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he did. And he was like, well, cool. His thing was about the money. So he we, we structured a deal, which was great for both of us. And he turned me into a household name, touring shows across the country. And I've made more money than I've made in my life at 24, 25, 26. So I'm going to ask you a question, a rumor that I heard. And if you say you'd rather not talk about it, we, we don't have to talk about it. Um. Were you, is this, is it true that you were going to either write a play or go on tour or do something with who we know as Robert Kelly, Mr. R. Kelly? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I was going to do Trapped in the Closet, the stage play. Really? He came to my, he came to Chicago when I, well, he lived in Chicago. He came to my show when I was in Chicago. Uh, the week prior, I went to the video shoot for Flirt. It was the the remix with with T.I. and T-Pain. So and you were there on the, when I they were filming I was there it. while they were filming it. And I was sitting there, and I was like, wow. And I didn't even know who T-Pain was because I wouldn't even listen to that stuff. I was listening to that music back then, and uh, I was like, this guy's very talented. Oh, he was my just, gosh. Because this is when, were you still on, on like, the pastor kick? So you no, were like, I wasn't the pastor kick. So I was how still, did you know the, the music? I just didn't, I never listened to uh, secular music, you know, and R. Kelly was the person that you're going to always hear stuff because it's going to come pop up at a family reunion, something you're going to hear R. For Kelly, sure. and I've always loved R. Kelly's music. And so with, but T-Pain, I didn't know, and his big song was I'm in Love with a Stripper. And so uh, I was sitting there, and um, I was like, look at this guy. He is so animated and so talented. I said, he's going to be something one day. <laughs> yeah, and somebody was like, no, he, he already is. I said, who is that? He said, it's T-Pain. I was like, who is that? <laughs> and so they began to tell me the the A&R the rep. And he was like, no, nah, he bad. And then I saw T.I. And I was like, oh, this T.I. So I was sitting there and I was like, man, I'm because uh, I went there to have a conversation with R. Kelly about doing this, this play. I want to do... You saved me the stage play. Um, but after we started talking, he wanted to do Trapped in the Closet. And so he came to my show um, the, the following week at uh, the Airy Crown in Chicago. And 
He was sitting up there in his suite, and after the show, we began to talk. He was like, man, it's amazing what you did, and this, this, this. And we had that whole conversation. He said, man, where you live? I said, I live in Dallas. He said, I'll tell you what, I have a concert going to Dallas. Why don't you come there? And um, I went to the show in, uh, well, first of all, let me back up to when. So I didn't know, like, I know all that. Being on girl, I, I you know I would hear, it, but you be thinking, <laughs> you be thinking it's a rumor. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'd be like, man, people be making all kind of crazy stuff about these celebrities. Because it kind of it sounds it sound crazy. Yeah, it sounds crazy. Yeah, you know, like peeing on a girl. He was doing what? Why would he? Like my brain was just like, I don't know what people just. I guess that's what happens when you become famous. People make up stupid stuff. So then one day, um, so that day he was there. It was he had about ten women with him. Ten. Girls that I would give them about 21. They look about 21. So, oh, thank God we ain't yeah. gonna use this interview yeah. as, as evidence. No, no, it was 21. We're gonna <laughs> yeah. say that. Okay. But they weren't allowed to speak to me in his presence. Pause and rewind. Excuse me? I was talking Markelly to him. I had 10 women with him and they were not allowed to speak to him. I walked up to one of them and I was like, hey, you enjoyed the show? Hey, excuse me. Hey, you enjoy the show? I said, dang, she stuck up. Went to the other girl. Hey, how you doing? You enjoy the show? Latarius, you are And she lying. turned her head and I said, so hey, man, what is... <laughs> so so the bodyguard, he said, come on, Latarius. He said, they're not allowed to speak to uh, another guy in R. Kelly's presence. I said, man, are you crazy? He was like, he was like, no, that's, that's what it is. And I sat there and I said... Cause that's weird. And so R. Kelly, he started talking to me because he was standing there. He was standing there while we were talking and then they were right there. So I spoke to them right. We were standing there and he just, he just stood there. Like it was just like, it was no big deal. He probably was checking us. Oh, probably boy. watching him to be like, well, I, said, I heard so much stuff about that whole little cap. That, you know, that's, that's a whole different story. So I was we, sitting there. We got time. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so we were sitting there and I was like, I was like, so the dude was talking to me. He said, um, Hey, listen, one thing I want to tell you, if you're going to work with R. Kelly, you can't tell him. Oh, that's what happened because he was overhearing us talking. R. Kelly was like, yeah, I want to do it's a whole bunch of more chapters I have entrapped in the closet. You know, I want to make it a stage play. I love how you write, brother, and this, 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 this. And I was like, I, I said, but let's do You Saved Me. That's more on brand for me. And I love that, you know, the B-side of the album, whereas You Saved Me, that's really dope. I want to do that. And he was like. Well, no, I don't know. You know, I want to, you know, I'd rather do Trap in the Closet, this, 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 this. And his bodyguard pulled me to the side. He said, no one tells R. Kelly no. He said, if you're going to work with R. Kelly, I'm trying to tell you, if you're going to work with R. Kelly, you got to always just say yes. I said, that don't work for me because I was always known. I was I was the dude in the playwright business that will always speak my mind. I call myself the Peter in the, in, in, in the crew. <laughs> I know that's yeah, right. I'm going to say what it is. So he was like, that's not going to work. And I said, well, no, I said, but he can't come. Now Now he's in my world. I got to show him how to win. He was like, man, all right. So then, so then R. Kelly was like, I'm going to invite you to, um, to my concert. I'm going to be in Dallas in a couple of weeks. So I went, my wife and my daughter. I, like, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm so naive. I done took my daughter that was probably about 12 years old you to R. Kelly concert. Naive. I'm you thought they were the going to be doing the You Save Me? Man, I thought they was going to be singing. He's going to just be singing a song. I know he's going to be sitting up here dry humping people and picking oh, them up yes. and simulating the oral sex. I didn't know all that. I'm sitting up there, I'm blocking my daughter's eyes. I'm like, this is crazy. What am I here for? And so uh, <laughs> after the concert, we go backstage. And then um, the bodyguard was like, your, 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 daughter, your daughter can't come. We was in the green room. He said, he can't, he can't come back there. I said, why? He was like, the the charges and i was like that's real he was like it's extremely real and i said but my daughter's with me like, she's like what, what's gonna happen he, he was like he's not allowed to be around any females under the age of 18 and that's when it got real and so i told my 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 then wife i was like hey listen i'm, we, I'm gonna talk to him we're gonna work this deal out or whatever and she ended up leaving and i sat there and i was sitting there next to him and he was talking to me and my mind just drifted. And, and I, I could just hear him like, wah, 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 wah. And my brain was like, I think he really did that to this girl. And at that point, everything. What, 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 why do you think you thought that? Because I just started seeing it. It was like, it was, it was like I had this spiritual moment in that moment. And I was like, it was like I could hear her. It's like I could hear this girl talking to me. And it was like, and I wrote about it one day where she was saying to me, no one believes me and no one is coming to help me. And I was sitting there and I was like, 
but if I do this deal with R. Kelly, my name is going to be everywhere. I will finally have a show that could rival Tyler Perry because Tyler Perry was killing in the market. I will finally have a show bigger than him with one of the biggest artists of our time. And I said, that's what I want. And he was sitting there talking to me and I, and I stopped and he was like, yeah, I want you to come up to the, he said, I want you to come to chocolate factory next week or whatever. And I looked at him and I was like, nah, I ain't gonna be able to do it. I just said that. And I said, nah, I ain't gonna be able to do it. And he said, huh? And then we was talking. I said, yeah, yeah. I don't know. And I said something real quick and got out the conversation and went on about my business. And the bodyguard called me. He was like, so what you going to do? You going to come? You going to come this way? I said, man, no. Nah. Because I had heard some stuff about him that I knew that he wasn't going to respect me. He was talking about even he was doing, the, he did a song with, uh, with uh, Michael Jackson. And they, uh, R. Kelly loved playing midnight basketball. And so he was playing basketball. Mike, Mike, Michael Jackson was at the studio waiting for R. Kelly. And R. Kelly was like, uh, he's going to have to wait. So I'm saying if you would make our, if you would make uh, Michael Jackson wait, you don't have no respect for me. I'm just uh, going to be just another <laughs> peon that you tell what to do. I was like, no, nah, I don't like I don't like the imbalance of that. You just I just don't I don't like that. And then that and then when I heard that girl's voice in my head and knowing that they just told my daughter that she couldn't come into this room is saying that as if I can't even defend my own daughter, like I'm going to let something happen to my own daughter in front of this guy who has been accused of sexual assault like that. And I said, this is, I'm in a world that I'm just, this, this is, this is something different. Yeah. And so at that point I said, you know what? Um, this ain't worth it. I don't know. I don't know all the particulars of, of what this is, but my spirit didn't feel right. And I said, I have to just, I have to back away from this situation. And I said, I would love to be for that girl. What, her father should have been for her mm -hmm. and to actually cover her and protect her and shield her from that type of stuff. And I didn't want to become another person that violated that girl. And so I walked away from it. And you know, what's so crazy. I don't know of anybody else that would have passed up an opportunity. Okay. And let me say this. There's going to be people watching right now to be like, yes, I would have. No, yeah, that's nah, because of what we moment. know now. Yeah, but not Because that time. even back then, <laughs> nobody really truly knew or, and or believed, right? It's, uh, it's not up until these last few years that, you know, we, we've heard further accusations. But back then, he was still loved and endear endeared. He was my hero. When I say I loved R. Kelly, like I was like, I loved, I'm bald headed like him. Like when I was that young, <laughs> I yeah. loved R. Kelly. So that's what I mean by it was hard because I was like, Oh no, that, that was your, that was your break. That was your breakthrough. My breakthrough. I would have been like Lateris R. Whitfield and R. Kelly teamed up to bring you, whether it's you save me or trapped in a closet stage play. Cause everybody Cause every is looking now, let me not say everybody, excuse me. So many people are looking for that cosign. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine having the one of the biggest artists in the world co-signing your idea, your brand, your this? Like, those are the moments that we live for. I saw for. it. I lived it. I sat around. I was like, man, this would be dope. He came. Because that, that was our third meeting. I went to his set. He came to my show. Then I went to his concert. So we was forming a relationship. I was like, oh, this is going to be the bomb. I got cool with his camp. Like, it was like, this is about to be really, really cool. And I was like, man. And I was like, God, this is amazing how you just open up doors like this. These are people I look up to, and now I'm actually about to get a chance to work with them. And when God sat there in that green room, and he was like, and I just, it's like I saw that girl's face. And I was like, yeah, I wrote a, I wrote a, I wrote a post about it. It's like a four part post on my Instagram a few years ago, uh, and I was like, I just didn't. I didn't want to do that girl like that. I really didn't. I really didn't want to violate this young girl. And people would be like, Well, I mean, you didn't really do nothing. You doing business or whatever. But my spirit. I try to do stuff that my spirit aligns with. And at that point, I knew that my spirit was like, No, the tears. You, you know, no, 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 no. It's, it's kind of like me. how they say, All money ain't good money. It ain't. All cosigns ain't great cosigns. It ain't. Look. You know, sometimes you can be just in the, I mean, who knows how things would have been for you if you would have accepted that and, you know, they would have been like. I would have been interviewed in a documentary because that means that. You knew. Yeah. Like I knew I was around it. I would have, I would have been and privy to a whole lot of, of other stuff. Yes. I would have been around. Like, what do you do at that point? Now you got a whole tour on the road and you see that. Like, what is that? You know, me and R. Kelly going to get in a fight. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like my brain, I, I'm, I'm a little different. You know what I'm saying? It's like, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm real different. Like that's that side I try to hide. But we would probably gotten a fight over some stuff like that because it's <laughs> like because I was I'm a, I'm a girl dad, so I can't I can't watch certain things and stand by. But that was the that was the big test in that moment because it was like, no, you didn't violate her physically, but are you gonna violate her by gaining from a man that could have allegedly done this to him, done this to this woman? So so. What was the moment for you where you knew that was the right decision? Because I don't care. No matter what your spirit is saying in that moment, you're going to go home and be like, Oh, I was. <laughs> you're going to be like, I mean, for weeks, months, did I make the right decision? It, it didn't hit me until it was, I was about to get ready to do another tour and the promoters had backed out. The, 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 it was two promoters, they were partnered with each other and they were at odds with each other. And so he lost his other side of the money basically and i was sitting on my rooftop deck um lived in these high-rise condos in downtown dallas and i was like god no all right what am i gonna do now prior to that i had the promoter the other promoter this jewish guy was telling me hey i'll take your show on the road but you gotta stop doing these altar calls at the end of your shows and i was like well, listen, I made God a promise that mm. if he took me on tour, yeah. I said I made that promise when I was 24 years old. If he took me on tour, I will lift his name up and invite people to accept Christ in his life, in, in, into their lives. I made him that promise. I can't do it. And he was like, well, I don't agree with all that stuff, so uh, I'm not taking the show back out on tour this next season. Mm. And I sat there, and that was during uh, Hurricane Katrina, and I had brought a family to live with me that I picked up uh, at Reunion Arena. And it was a family of four. They came, stayed in my one-bedroom condo. I wasn't married at that time. And so when they said that, when he, when he so they're staying with me. Then I get a phone call. We have that conversation, and I'm going, wow, God, like I'm over here helping people, and now I don't even know how, like I have no income for the next until I get another a gig or whatever. And, and being a player, it doesn't happen like Heck that. Heck no, yeah. boy. You, there's, there's a lot of Far money going behind between, you. Yeah. waiting on opportunities. You're just like, Jesus. So I was sitting on my rooftop, and this lady walked by, and she she always called me Willie. This is white girl. She's like, hi, Willie. Letarius, Melissa. She's like, you look like a Willie, so I'm going to call you Willie. So she was always, she was always calling <laughs> me Willie. Yeah, was... hey, Willie. I was like, okay. So she was talking to me one day, and uh, she would smoke cigarettes, but – she was pregnant, and I told her, I said, listen, you can't smoke cigarettes around me, you know, being pregnant that's going to injure your child. You know, you can't do that. And she was like, she was like, well, uh, don't tell my husband. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on this play that I'm planning on getting on the road or whatever. She said, play, so, you know, uh, what do you need to make a play go on the road? I said, money. And then she said, well, my husband has plenty of money, so uh, I'll tell him to meet with you. And I said, uh, okay. So I met with him the next day. Just on the rooftop, he was uh, he lived in the condo, and he bought up all the empty units so he can flip it. And he was like, uh, so what you do? I said, I write plays. He said, black people go to plays? I said, yes, they do. And Lord, then, not only was she calling you really now. He said, "Black people don't go." I'm telling you, they just don't. They just don't know. They just don't know. Oh, so he said, and that's when Tyler Perry just did a 200 million dollar deal with TBS. Okay. And I said, "This is the guy at the top of the food chain in my industry. He just did a deal, 100 episodes, 200 million dollars." He he looked at the article. He's like, "Wow." He said, "So uh, you have talent like that?" I said, "Certainly." He said, "What do you need to uh, go on the road?" I said, "I need about 500 thousand dollars." He said, okay. He said, give me a one sheet. I don't need to know a whole bunch of particulars. I need to know how much you need, when you need it, what's the risk involved, the rate of return on my money, and uh, when I get my money back. Just answer those questions. I put that together. Me and my uh, ex-wife at the time was already working on a proposal. So she was like, oh, we got that. Sent that right to him uh, that, that same day. Next day, he had asked me, he was like, man, how are you doing financially? He said, uh, and at that time, my account was overdrawn seven hundred dollars, seven hundred twenty-seven dollars to be exact. <laughs> and he said, "He said, do you need any?" Um, he said, "Do you need any money?" I said, "No, nah, that's not even a question to ask somebody." I'm living in this high-rise condo. I got a Lexus. Like, I'm, I'm, why would you ask me that? Yeah. He said, but you were in a hole because clearly oh, you live in a hole. Oh, I was in a hole. Oh, way. <laughs> when I tell you that condo was expensive and the HOA was like nine hundred and fifty-four dollars a month, and that's just for the valet and all that stuff. Uh, he said. You need any money? He said, just shoot me a text about uh, how much you need, and I'll have a check for you tomorrow morning. I said, what? 
He had an office in the Plaza of Americas. I said, I need $10,000. He said, pick it up at noon. I went there. I said, what am I involved? So I was nervous. I was yeah, like, what, what am I involved? What kind of cartel? Yeah, I was yeah. like, what am I I was scared. I walked in the office. The office was unlocked. It was nobody at the front desk. It just had an envelope with my name on. I said, what is this? <laughs> my, mind you, that's the only time I ever had a conversation with that man the day before. I opened a check. It was $10,000. He ran um, um, a mutual fund of like uh, upwards of like $30 million or something crazy. So he was like, all right, let's do this deal. So we ended up doing a deal, and that's how my national play, I went back out with my play issues. We all got them. God, God has had so much favor over your life. And that's when I that's knew God so was crazy. Real. It was like, it was like I late- turned that down, and then they, they, they opened that door. So I was like, all right, Just God, because you're on the rooftop and let the lady call you Willie. And call me Willie. And I'll be Willie every day, you get me. <laughs> <laughs> and, they end up, and they end up putting up seven hundred thousand dollars for that show. Really? At the end of the day, it ended up being seven hundred. And the promoter ended up backing out because he was doing too many shows. And he was like, "Well, the terrace, I'll just give you the routing that I had, which was the venues." And so I literally had to take that show out by myself. And so me and the 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 investors was like, "Hey, you've been doing this for years. You know what you're doing, right?" I said, "I think." So let's go ahead and do it. And I took that show out on the road. I was like 27 years old or something. With, Were you able to pay him back his money? Not not at all. Latarius, you were lying. <laughs> lost 167 thousand dollars. <laughs> Latarius uh, lost 167 thousand. Was he mad? I don't know what he was because I because they were. <laughs> <laughs> I was not I was like, expecting that. Oh, yeah, answer. yeah. His story don't always end the way you want it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we took it out. We made $5 million. Nope, I lost $167,000. Okay, that was yeah. honest. And okay. then I didn't get the money. I had a deal where I get $240,000 a year. I didn't get none of that. But one thing that I made sure was my cast got paid. Because at one point they were like, we're not going to pay the cast because we're in the we're in the hole and all this. I said, listen, these people came out on the road on my name and all this. Don't pay me. Make sure they get paid. Have you seen them since, that couple? Nuh-uh. Mm-mm. Okay. No, nah, they just was like, we dissolved the company that we built, <laughs> and that was just it. And they, and that's little money to them. they like, whatever. And they used to doing big deals, and they, they don't go through whatever. He was just like, all right. Me, I was just like, $167,000, just gone. You oh. know what I'm saying? But then I had a conversation with Tyler Perry's promoter, Arthur Primus, and uh, he was like, that's all you lost? And I was like, that's a lot of money. He said, man, you did good. On your first show, you only lost 167000 He said, I lost $1.5 million with this other show he was doing. And he was like, I said, $1.5 million? He said, I lost $1.5 million. He said, you did your investors really good if you only lost 167000 He said, wow. that means you know what you're doing. I said, how does that mean I know what I'm doing? <laughs> I lost one hundred sixty seven. He said, bro. It could have been way, but, and that's why I said it's called perspective. Perspective. And he taught me. He was like, I lost one point five, and I know what I'm doing. Yeah. He said, I lost with one, this one show one point five million, but these other shows I'm doing with Tyler, I'm making two million a, a week. Mm. He said, but Oof. stuff just don't work that way. Yeah. And I was just like, thank you, Arthur. But he gave me some. Oh, he gave me great perspective. I mean, that man is absolutely brilliant. So. Real quick, because I I know we're limited on time, but I want to fast forward to now, dear future wifey, mm-hmm. it's doing very well. It's doing pretty good. <laughs> I, I hope you you almost spit that out, <laughs> telling it like that's okay. You could be humble. I'll brag on you. Um, you're waiting for the one, right? How difficult is it? Because come on, let's be real. In the, I, winter, I, in the winter months, it gets real hard. First of all, I'm seriously, because the reason why I say that is because, look, I've been in the industry for 19 years. Yeah, yeah. So I know what a a, a, a little bit of clock will do. Look, you ain't even verified on Instagram yet. Just wait till you get that blue check, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but I know I am like, look, being in radio for as long as I've been in is so funny because... Even the dudes on the street team begin playing. They do. They do. Because you have this big brand behind you. Right. You have grown this brand so successfully. And you are, how do I put this? You say, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to just say say. It's not that you just say it. You are what most women are looking for. Right. Or or in their minds, right? right? Um. And so I know they're coming on to you. Yeah. So all the time. how how hard is it 
to actually say the single guy and not turn into a hoe in these streets. In 2020, I was. <laughs> in 2020, I'm telling you, in 2020, before I took a vow of abstinence, in 2020, I was like, yeah. God it, has blessed me, so oh, I'm going to yeah. let him bless but it was, Yeah, it was women, and I talk about it. I'm open. I, it was an episode I did with Jay Barnett, and I talked about my son Armani finding condoms in the uh, armrest of my car. He was like, Dad, what are you doing with this? I said, what do you think I'm doing with this? He was like, you're a Christian. You ain't supposed to be having sex. I was like, how do you think I deal with raising you? You're you're very stressful. I need a stress relief. Oh, uh, my reliever. gosh. That's that what I told him. I was like, you got to talk to your boys. So I told him, he was like, you're, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be doing this. And I was just like, wow. So here he is. He's challenging me as a father. And um, I was like, wow, that's pretty deep. He was right. You know, uh, later on that year, I ended up taking a vow of abstinence. Uh, since then, I've, I've, I've fallen off, you know, <laughs> and uh, now I'm back on the I'm back on the pony again and said, let's 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 try this thing out. But I'm very self-aware about um, this season, like this season, this this winter season. Uh, it, it does something to me. It's like cuffing season is real Listen. It's, it goes back since the beginning of time and so since I'm extra aware of it then I'm trying to be proactive and stay busy and um, really get into a, a, a posture of submission with God and be like God okay I can't fail every winter season and keep expecting something to be greater and I can't keep falling in the fall <laughs> okay <'Cause, laughs> I can't keep falling in the fall come on somebody That's real. and so I said so I want to I want to do something different this season I want to literally successfully go through this season get totally submitted to you because I've seen you do so many great things for me uh, just this year alone. So I want to just, I want to literally live a consecrated life. Cause you know how the enemy will do like Lazarus. He will sit back. He don't mind you getting this platform. He don't mind you talking about God. He don't mind you loving the Lord. He don't mind all these things. <laughs> At all. But he will make you a dang fool publicly. <laughs> Literally, he will, Lateris. And it's it. like, that's why they say be careful what we ask for. Yes. Because, you know, you messing up two years ago is not like you messing up today. Nah. You doing, hoeing in the streets, doing whatever you did 10, 15 years ago is nothing like today. No. Nah. Because now you have a reputation and there's a level of expectation, sometimes unfairly. Yep. Sometimes people put you on an unfair platform yes. and expect perfection out of you, which I think you are very clear about being imperfect. Right. But even when you're saying that. They be like, but now but, as a man of God, why are you over here still smashing? Be like, yes. same reason why you smashing. <laughs> Shoot, that's why. But even with you saying you're imperfect, that makes you more perfect because you say you're imperfect, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, true. it's just so much more. At stake. Yeah. And that's what, I, and that's what I'm aware of. I'm extremely aware of that now. And I'm like, and the truth be told, I can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Like Insanity. I said earlier, so if I truly, truly want my wife, I got to at least wait for her. You know what I'm saying? I can't go from one woman's bed into her bed. You know, I can't be like, you uh, know. Uh, yeah. Can you please change the mattress, sir? The well, sheets We're going to wash the sheets. We do wash the sheets. Oh, see, that ain't no but a... <laughs> Don't even get me started. <laughs> but no, Ooh. so I know I can't do that. So at the end of the day, I got to... And plus, I want to become more disciplined. Like in the past, me stepping out on my wife multiple times, I got to go fix that. God said that I'll never be faithful to my wife unless I first become faithful to him. And so in that faithfulness, I have to go ahead and kill that Goliath. That's a Goliath. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't gamble. Sex has always been a Goliath in my life. Mm -hmm. I love sex. And the, and the minute I realize that that's okay, but sex out of God's will can lead to a lot of destruction. So now I'm like, okay, God, you know I love sex so bring it and bring it on but let me go ahead and accomplish this goal that you have me which is living a, a disciplined life because at the end of the day unless I conquer this thing I'm going to keep doing I'll marry the woman that God chose for me and I'll end up violating that marriage because I still never was disciplined in that area and yep. so God is calling me to be disciplined when you find the one what happens to the Dear Future Wifey podcast does it become we are wifey and hubby? I don't. I don't know. No. <laughs> we, have so a, we have. We have. We have. We have a brand. We have a brand uh, that my future wifey will have, and the world would have to watch out what happens to dear future wifey. But I've got. I've gotten. A, I've gotten an exit strategy. Okay. 
Yeah. So it'd be something really Look, dope. I'm going to say this. You going to be happy, <laughs> but these women going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies are going to hate her. No, oh, I'm just God. joking. I'm just nah, joking. they going to love it. They're going to be... They, they, I think they'll embrace it because they've walked this journey with you. Even the ones that will be sliding in your DMs. And be saying that they my wife. You yes. know what I'm saying? And I'll be like, no. No, it's, <laughs> just, it's, just, no. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. Um, but I, I understand it. I understand the mission right now. I understand what God... And my whole thing is, is not trying to be a unicorn in this world, but I've been encouraging other men to embrace this level of truth and transparency so that they can operate in the highest version of themselves because the truth be told, uh, none of us are perfect. None of, we all make mistakes. The problem is when you find people that can't admit their mistakes. Right. And so I just said, this is what I did. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I've, I was, I was that dude and I hated that. It was a time where I was so depressed because I kept cheating on my wife and I never wanted to be that dude. I was the one that would always criticize my homeboys who cheated on their wives. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why would you get married? You're going to cheat on your wife. What kind of dude? Blah, 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 blah. And then I became everything I despise. Normally we all, we all do trust. And so I said, you know what? Here's my do-over, and I'm going to do it over right this time. Mm -hmm. But then God has been reverse engineering some things in my life, healing me from past childhood trauma, literally digging up some of that stuff, excavating that pain and hurt, making me face myself in the mirror. And so what people see me do every uh, Wednesday is just face myself in the mirror, and I go, this is who I am. This is what I don't like about myself. This is what I'm overcoming. Whoop, I accomplished it this time. I'm happy. Thank you, God, for this. And it's just, it's just a continual process. And so I've been a lot of men, uh, which I would definitely like to shout out the brothers who DM me that's like, say, bro, like, thank you for showing me what real looks like. Thank you for helping me go through this. That's and good. that's what's been very very impactful regardless of the dms from women because these men i've counseled couples you know on instagram uh on instagram we end up uh facetiming each other on instagram and i'm talking to the couples or whatnot to do zoom calls with people so it's just when i look at that level of of impact that god is doing that's where i get extremely humble be like wow god because i'm able to provide for other men that are married what wasn't provided for me that's good. And so I said, you know what? And I, like I said, we make mistakes. It's just that when we get to the place where we can say, hey, I did this. How do I overcome it? Then, Because uh, a lot of times when we make mistakes, we run from it and be like, it's over. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just start over with somebody else. And so to have these conversations with people and seeing their marriage begin to heal from that, mm -hmm. that's the great reward. But knowing that sex is a struggle for you. Mm-hmm. You want to meet her and get married within a matter of a month, don't you? When I meet her, I, six months tops. <laughs> I'm telling you, six months top. And I'm going to be rubbing on a booty every month. Oh, my God, you can't months. do that. I'm going to rub a booty. <laughs> now, that's what I'm going to do. If I, can, if I can stay out of her vagina, the least I can oh do is rub a booty. <laughs> That's the word of the Lord. Okay, well. No, that's fact. I think we're going to end it right there. No, we're going to keep talking because that's what I like talking about. <laughs> But that's the facts. And I said that. And this, you know, and it's like, it's the reality of I like applicable Christianity. Cause oftentimes, like, and I'm gonna tell you the truth be told, I talked to a lot of counselors where they'll um couples to get married, Christian couples, and they were successful in their abstinence journey. And neither one of them, they're not even kissing each other, they're not touching each other. But then they get married and now they're now they need a sex therapist because they become so disciplined that they don't even want to have sex with each other. Or even more extreme. The man doesn't even like women. They done got married, and the reason why he was so disciplined, wouldn't touch her, wouldn't kiss her, wouldn't rub, oh. rub on her, do nothing, because he's struggling with his sexuality, you know, or even more so, he may be asexual, just don't, whatever it is. That's, that's not my testimony. So my thing is, I know the propensity I have towards sex. I will touch my woman. I will but what, what about her. what about a, what about somebody who says... You have to, what do they say? You have to test the car, you to test drive the car test. before you you pull it off the lot. Because how do you know that you guys will be sexually compatible? Because rubbing on somebody's butt and, and yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean there's sexual compatibility. No, but I do believe that God in his infinite wisdom, living a disciplined life in that regard, there's things that you'll see with each other. Like I can tell chemistry with somebody real quickly because I'm, 
highly sexual. So if a woman is like, if I'm dating a woman for six months and she don't even want to kiss me, she don't want to touch me, she ain't laying all on me, she ain't rubbing on me, if she ain't never just rubbed my penis one time, like at the end of the day, it's like, okay, that's a problem. Because at the end of the day, you got to at least want to have sex. If, if It has to be... What if she's a virgin? Do you think that your wife is a virgin? Your future wife is a virgin? I don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't. I don't. She could be. You know, uh, at first, God had to heal me from that. Because at first, I was like, I don't want a virgin. And then God said, why? And it became, I felt unworthy to be with a virgin. It had nothing to do with her. It just had something to do with, you know, being with all these women. Now you want a virgin. You know, and I was like, no, I never wanted one. But it came from unworthiness. So as God's been healing me from unworthiness. So now that we're, so, so taking the unworthiness part out of it. If God's purpose for me to marry a virgin, I will marry her. Okay, you said my nervously. propensity. <laughs> well, because my propensity is a woman with a little track record. That's just that's just that's just me. But that again, because it's like, what is it? Because you want want her to know what she's doing? Not even that. I just want her to be free in her sexuality. You know, it's it's like what I said. Shout out to virgins because I honor them. I respect them. Absolutely. It's it's just the fact that and, and it's she a can, beautiful thing. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. But if she's a virgin that is. Open. Open and has become one with herself sometimes. Then that No, you have to. No, Latarius, you don't all virgins do not have all virgins do not have to. They do though. No, the, all do. virgins do not. You tell me you so you you know virgin women they ain't never masturbated. Well, I don't I don't know no virgin women. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so not that I know of, but most I, virgin women I most I, virgin women I know have at least done some stuff. They've they they've masturbated before, they've they've done oral sex with with, with 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 somebody before and had it done on them, they just never ever been penetrated. I have never met a virgin yet, especially in this age of 40 and 30s that have never even touched their own vagina. Okay. Well, if you are out there and you ain't never touched your vagina, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Please hit but up with Terry. But it's probably dirty because you ain't never cleaned it because you ain't never touched it. You don't touch it like that to have a... All right, yes, so th this is why I said the conversation was going to end like no, 10 no, minutes No, it's ago. not going to end. <laughs> yeah. This is the show that never <laughs> ends. <laughs> it just goes on and on, my friend. That's a jam. <laughs> Somebody, that's the jam, boy. You understand me? <laughs> okay. So tell everybody how they can follow you, Mr. Lateris R. Whitfield. That's how they can follow me on Instagram and on, on uh, at Lateris R. Whitfield and then on YouTube. Dear Future Wife, you make sure you uh, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. And I want to say this again. Thank you for supporting my um, my podcast. Do you know why? No. You have such greatness inside of you. And so one thing about it is God has given me a unique ability to see greatness in people. As a director, uh, I could see talent and be like, they'll be perfect for this. I can get two years out of them because they're so great as this and they can carry the story, all this type of stuff. I can see that. And so with you from a long time ago, you came and auditioned for a play that <laughs> I was, uh, it was a movie. Yeah. Uh, Georgia Sky. I didn't even know you then. At all. I was a baby. Yeah. That, that had to be 20 years ago. Yep. You was auditioning for a, a, a movie called Georgia Sky, and I was on the cast and directing team. And uh, Tyler Perry was going to produce this movie. And, um, yeah, and you walked in, and I said, this girl can act. And so then I would watch you throughout the years. You would involve me on stuff that you would do a Project uh, 16 and, like, speak at schools or whatnot. And I always saw your genuine heart. You have a genuine heart and an affinity towards mankind. And so anybody that loves mankind like that, God's hand is over their life. And so in moments where you try to get discouraged, I'm like, I can't let you give up because you got too much purpose. And that's the reason why you feel so attacked and you feel like giving up in certain areas and maybe this ain't going to work and maybe this ain't going to work. It's because uh, mm. there's so much purpose in you. Even when you were doing the Local Love Awards um, that I won two years in a row, but <laughs> the Local Love Awards, you were like, I'm done with this. I say, wow, you understand how much hope you're giving to people. This is great. People find a great honor to win. And what did you say the reason why you stopped doing it? It's because people started bickering behind the scenes. I just, I didn't create. So for those of you that don't know, the Local Love Awards, it was a, an award show that we were highlighting black-owned businesses, entrepreneurs, and even community 
uh, I'm going blank on like, like nonprofits, nonprofits and yeah. stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to use my platform of being on the radio because like we have a lot of people that are like a lot of minority. I mean, we're really black businesses that are out here killing it. But yep. come on now, marketing dollars are expensive. Yep. You just don't have the the necessarily the financial space to be able to advertise. And I'm like, golly, these people are so great. And I wanted to use my platform to like, you know, bring attention to them. I really yeah. wanted to do that. But the, the thing that was hurtful to me was the people in the same categories started like really treating it like if I lose, then it was going to be like a, a negative. And I'm like, you won because you were only five out of the entire, yeah. you know, city or whatever the case may yeah. be. And it was just really disheartening to me because I never want to be in a space where I am creating the chaos. And that's what I was saying about the heart that you have. You created something so great, but the minute that it began to be toxic, you walked away from it because it wasn't worth it. And it was great. It was amazing. The event was beautiful. It was it was black excellence. But you walked away from it because it began to be toxic. It got so far away from the vision of celebra celebration and began to be degradation at the end of it. Uh, you know, as a preacher, you got to rhyme words, so you just got to find some. So it, it was a celebration, and it began to become degradation, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so that's what ended up happening, and you walked away from it. And again, I saw your heart, because you could have kept on doing it. You could have kept doing it, not looking like, oh, I done gave up on this. It looks like a failure. No, you just said, I don't want it. It's too stressful. It's causing too much bickering. I'm walking away from it. So when you find, when I see people that operate like that from a place of integrity, uh, then God's hand is over their life. And if they stay consistent with the things that God has called them to do, you can't do nothing but be successful. And that's why everything you touch, whether you know it or not or believe it or not, is prospering. Because you're just going through the process before the promise. Even with the Dash podcast, it's an honor to, to, to serve you in this, in this capacity because I can't wait. I'm one of those people to say, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Oftentimes, people would say, I believe in you. I believe in you. Hey, did you go buy my product? No, but I believe in you. <laughs> right. Hey, uh, have you watched my last episode? No, but I believe in you. I'm one of them type of people that be like, I believe in you. Come on, we're going to grind this thing out. I ain't made one dollar off of this podcast. Not one cent. But watch. Watch today. We're going to look back and be like, yeah, we over here on this island. Yeah, you remember when we was about to give up on that? That's that's the process before the problem. It's the same thing that I see in every area of my life. And that's why the Bible says, uh, I pray that your faith fail not. Because we can have faith in one area and see God do it in one area of our life. But then we go through a little adversity. We go through something that don't work out the way we want it to work out. And then we say, all right, forget it. My faith has failed me. No, no, no. It was doubt that failed you. And at the end of the day, the same God that told you to do the dash, the same God that allowed you to go through all this stuff to, to make it happen and to do the work of getting the logos created and to get the trademark, all, all that stuff. It's the same God. And that's why we cannot give up. And the dash is going to be absolutely amazing. I just want to thank you. Um, I don't even know if I shared this with you. And I think that I possibly did. It may have been about three or four months ago. Um, a friend of mine, had kept she kept telling me about this prayer service. And she said, you have to go. They'll pray over you. And when I went there, um, I really didn't want to go. It, was, it wasn't very many people there. It was like 30 people. It was praise and worship. They, you know, a little bit of word in between, but it really is to go down and get prayer. So I said, I'm going to go get prayer. I remember walking up to the front and, you know, there's people to pray for you at the front of the church or whatever. And this was not my church. There were people to pray for me, pray for you at the front. And they said, go right here. And I remember thinking, these are some little girls. Like they... <laughs> You tell the people that's going to pray for you? Yes. Because they look so young. You know, they were babies. I was like, I need the old lady that's been like, <laughs> I'm talking about, she been in church her whole life. I know she a prophet. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? But I literally in that moment had to surrender and say, okay, let me close my eyes mm -hmm. and just receive. And I was hoping God had a word for me. And... Like the first five, 10 seconds, I'm judging the prayer, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just like, okay, again, I needed, I need, I needed uh, <laughs> Sister Bertha down there that was going to take it home quick. Yeah. They were going and I'm just like, okay, okay. And it was like the moment I released, 
I remember, I don't remember everything. And I have it in my, I have it in my phone because I kind of regurgitated it when I left. But all of a sudden, the girl starts to prophesy over my life. One thing that she said is like, I don't know, you're building something, is what she said. I still don't know what that means because I think it's bigger than just the dash, mm -hmm. right? But she's saying you're building something. But one thing I will never forget is she said, you won't have to do it alone. She said, you're so afraid because you've always had to do things alone. And God is going to send you the people that are going to help you build. Those are called destiny helpers. And I think that if I'm being honest, through this process of you like helping me, let me not say helping me, supporting me. Um, just because of my lack of trust for, you know, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about this. You know how I am. Um, I think I keep waiting for the day that you're going to throw it back in my face. Which is unfair. Um, in all honesty, every time I'm driving here. To record, there is a guilt because I haven't made any money. And I know the hard work that you put into this. And my guilt is like, because I know how tired you are. And so there's a part of me that's like, you question, like, why would he do this for me? As tired as he is, as busy as he is. And I know, you know, me and you just talk just as yeah. friends offline. And so I know you don't mean to make me feel like a burden, but me knowing how tired you are, I feel guilty coming here sometimes because I'm like, I know he needs to rest. I know he has other things to do. Um, but at the same time, I have to allow God like to break those things off of me um, from just being hurt in the past by people that believed in me or, or said that they would help. I'm, I'm not, I would never do this and, you know, like <laughs> it, whenever it's time for it to pop off or whatever, be like, okay, appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not like that. Um, but anyways, um, you said you sent me a text in 2019. Yeah, it was in 2019. It was in 2019 where I talked about that God was going to see 2019, 2020, I think it's 2019, but God was going to, uh, change your life where it don't look the same, but you were not going to be working at K104. And, um, and you and I had a conversation around that time where you were like, I don't know what I would do if. You're not working at K104. And I was saying that whatever it is, God, see, one thing I know about God, and this is when I say I know, it's always been seasons in my life where I always didn't know. <laughs> like, I, I was like, I'm this national playwright. What happens next? I remember telling God, listen, if I ever stop touring, uh, if I ever stop touring plays, you might as well take me off this earth because I, I, I ain't got nothing else to do. And like, what, what else am I going to do? I became this national touring playwright. Now what it looks like. God said, huh. That's nothing. That's nothing. And then next thing I know, I'm doing T-shirts. I have a clothing line. I'm doing T-shirts at school. And uh, and I was like, man, this is cool. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing that. See, each stage of our life, God shows up and takes us to the next level. That's why life is a journey. That's why I love the podcast being called The Dash, because I can take you through different stages of my life and say, I was doing this in this stage. And now some people don't even know different stages of my life. Like no one ever knew 90% of the stuff we talked about today. They're like, what well, are you carrying pistols? You were doing what? You was doing what? That's a part of my dash. You know, the people that know me as Dear Future Wife, he just know me as Dear Future Wife. There's some people that say, oh, I know the playwright Letters. You know what I'm saying? Well, he got a podcast. I know he got a podcast. Be like, you don't know he got a podcast? No, nah, I know you're doing one the plays. One of the biggest. Uh, yeah, one of yeah. the biggest relationship podcasts in the United States. I didn't know that, but his plays, boy. I love his plays, boy. He got this. Someone sent me a picture of one of the playbills and their ticket and was like, 
I didn't realize this whole time this was you. I went to your play when it was in this market. Hey, you went to New Haven, uh, Connecticut. I went to the play then. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Part of my dash. And so you've done radio for 19 years. That was a part of your dash. But even that's not your purpose. That was just a part of the part. That was a part of the purpose. God allowed you to go through all of that to learn. And I'm telling you, it happens as, as sure as I sit in this seat. I know this to be true, that the stuff that you learned in radio for all those years is transferable skills that you needed in order for God to take you for where he's going to take you. You're going to look back and be like, oh, I know that. Oh, that's why I know I did it. Oh, I did that. Oh, I did. It becomes that moment. So when people see me right now doing my podcast and I go, yeah, I can do merchandise. Why? I used to have a clothing line. Oh, I know I do uh, graphic design for my thumbnails or whatever. I did graphic design in my season. I had to teach myself to I reinvented myself, start doing graphic design. I know I do. How you know I do all this stuff? I did it all before. And they all just converge for this moment of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. And then my last iteration of it is when I do a TV show and do a movie or whatever. They're like, when did he become a writer? I didn't know that. He used to be a writer. Oh, that's why he write these letters. Oh, he, okay, he's a writer. Oh, I didn't know that. All of that. That's why the Bible says, for I know all things work together. So the stuff that you've learned in radio and the stuff you've even learned before that and all this little stuff, these speaking engagements that you have, that God is bringing, you're making, your, making you more recognizable in different markets, you got to think about it. Like, like I said, this, this interview can go extremely long, but I'm going to leave it with this. Your name has been heard in markets that your feet haven't even stepped. Hmm. And if we if we really sit back and be like, well, I mean, but how is God in that? He marketed you in places that you're going to go to later on. They're like, weren't you on this radio show? Oh, your name just sounds recognizable. So when they end up hearing something where you've been advertised in a certain market and they go, yeah, I know, I know her. They're like, I don't know where I know her from, but I just her name sounds recognizable. And then they meet you and they hear your story. They go, oh, oh, you was on the radio show. Man, I used to listen to that every morning. Oh, I used to go to work. I would listen to that. Because now he's taking you in places that your feet have not stepped. I'm telling you, people will market you. Help me, Holy Spirit. The enemy will market you in places that the Lord wants to bless you will take you in the place and you don't even understand it. You'd be like, well, how in the world is, what does that have to do with anything? When you show up in that moment, you look back and I call it that before place because God gives us glimpses of our destiny. You go and you go, wow, this seems familiar. I, I think I had a dream about this one day. I, I remember I was on the stage. I was speaking at this or whatever. That's what this was for. All things work together. And that's what I say. We got to understand because if you're truly submitted to God, one of the scriptures I used to hold on to ever since I was 17 years old, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Not could, not maybe shall be added. So if we get our mind and our heart and our eyes on Christ seeking the kingdom business, all the stuff that you've been doing, people don't. People couldn't even imagine. You talking about me being tired? No, let's talk about Jay. How you were running around, getting up at what? Two in the morning? Three. Three in the morning to go do a morning show. But then you done spoke at some schools that day, the, the day before. You done went and hosted this. You done hosted a, a, a prom this day. You may have spoken at this event. You done did all this stuff. And you get up and <sighs> go and work. And most of the stuff that you were doing the serving stuff you wasn't getting paid for. You do it because you love it. You love kids. You understand what legacy building truly is. And you have no idea that some kid that may have heard you speak at their high school or middle school or whatever may be the very person that God uses later on to be like, man, yeah, you said something to me. It changed my life. I'm, I'm very wealthy and such, 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 such. Let me go and sow a seed in you. you like, what in the, you, hold on. You was that little bad kid that was in such, such, yeah. But you, you actually pulled me aside one day, and you made me see myself for the very first time. I'm telling you, I see this stuff all the time. I've had people, man, let me tell you something. I ain't going to go through all these testimonies. But I'm telling you, if stuff like that happens, you go, okay, I see a guy. I see what you did. I understand when, when God says his plan is to prosper you and to give you a great future, he meant that. Not a great present, a future, because he's always looking 
forward. And he says, Jade, I hear you. I, 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 I hear you cry. I hear you get upset. I hear you get frustrated. I hear you. I see you wondering, like, what is my next level? The next level, the only way you can find your next step is seeking the will of God and God to start ordering your steps. That's why the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered. Is the is righteousness means right standing. So the minute that you fall into this place of righteousness to be like, all right, God, this all right, I'm in this uncharted territory. I need you to guide me. God said, come on over here. And he'll take your hand. I used to love the, the, the story about the footprints in the sand. I remember that as a little kid that he was like, then this right here where I was walking beside you. Now you see these foot these, these footprints. There's only just one person walking. That's when I was carrying you. And so right now you're going through your carrying stage where God is now carrying you into your next dimension. And I'm going to conclude on that. I have to ask you a question. First of all, I receive everything that you're saying. I just have to have a real moment for a second. Um, because I desire to seek God. Um, I desire for him to lead the next in my life. Um, so I do, when I wake up in the morning, I, you know, ask him, I mean, you know, I talk to him, whatever the case may be, but sometimes I wonder, am I doing it habitually? Because I know that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, how do I know that I'm doing it pleasing in his sight? And then what about the moments when the reality of, I don't even know what to pray for myself anymore. You know, I have friends that have a vision for their life that is so clear. You're one of those. <laughs> I'm surrounded around people right now that yeah. have this really clear vision. And the weight of the world is on my shoulders when people say, so what are you going to do next? And I literally have no clue. What do you say? I'd be like, I'm still waiting on, you know, whatever God has for me. Like, That's it. But it's like. That's it. See, when I say that's it, that is it. I want to hear what you say because that's important. If you go, well, I'm working on some things I'm doing. If the, the, well, no, the because say I say I want my next to be what God wants it yes. to be and not what people expect of me. Yes. But, like, I guess I get, there's, there's so many, like, the reality of transition in everybody's life, and even when I wasn't in transition, first of all, let's be clear, imposter syndrome is very real. Yes. Like, you may see a certain talent, and I'm like, well, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not talented, yeah. right? But it's just like, but, but how do I bottle this up and package this up and, and sell this to the world so that the world can see the talent? Right. Um, the imposter syndrome part of it, the... Like, sometimes I just get, like, tired of waiting on God. And then sometimes, you know, like, like even with the Dash podcast, let's be clear, we're telling mostly black stories. And not that we're against telling other stories, but we're telling stories. And a lot of these people that have come on the Dash podcast, they probably wouldn't get invited exactly. other places. Yeah. And and there we talk about their setbacks and we... um give them their flowers. But sometimes it feels like when you're doing like it on this scale, it's not what people want to watch. You got to bring in a celebrity. I'm not against that. Yeah. Right. Cause I mean, obviously that will yeah. happen, but I'm just saying like, you got to be getting the big names. You got to be, you know what I mean? Like people don't understand how hard it literally is to build from the bottom up. Oh, it's extremely hard. Um, And so it's like, Sometimes you feel like, and when I make this statement, I don't mean perfect. Because, boy, when I tell you I got so many faults and I've done so many things I shouldn't have done, like I am imperfect through and through. But sometimes you feel like telling the good stories and being a good guy doesn't win. You're right. Like the people are looking for the mess and, yep. the, you know, so just all of these things. But I, I can like kind of hear myself talking right now and everything that I'm talking about is just fear driven. Yeah. And it's like I cannot wait to be free from that. But it's the daily process. And so that's what I mean by God hears you. 
you're in the state right now of learning, growing, trying to understand. That is the best place. You know, people talk about the success of Dear Future Wifey. That's all it was, is me trying to understand and me trying to not trying to figure it out. Like, like when you ask me, did I know it's going to be the, no, I didn't even know. I don't know when a video go viral. You can't make a video go viral. You can't make none of this happen. I just literally said, I'm going to stay submitted to whatever it is in my heart. That's the only thing I can show up authentically in my life is doing what I enjoy doing it the way that I do it. Where somebody can say, oh, that's corny. You write these letters to this imaginary woman. Or this is blah, blah, blah. This is me. I guess I'm going to be corny. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't know how to be anything other than that. But then I hear so many women like, oh, God, that that restored my hope in men. I, I hated men. I hated this. But your letter healed a part of me. So that's what I mean by just authentically showing up with who I am. And so nobody can beat you being you. Mm -hmm. As fearful as you are, mm -hmm. be fearful in it. Mm -hmm. Do it afraid. Whatever it is, just do it. And if you have questions with God, ask the question. He's big enough to answer. If you don't even know the answer, if you feel like he's not giving you the answer, just keep doing it. At the end of the day, we try to figure everything out. I don't know nothing. I literally don't know. One thing that I do know about this podcast, I know that God told you to do it. And I know God told me to do it. That's it. So when you talk about, oh, he's sleepless nights and sacred, yes, but God told me to do it. So it's like, it's like I can get mad and be like, this ain't, this ain't, this ain't making me no money. It don't matter. It don't matter. It don't matter because I know that even if I don't make a dime from it, my obedience is better than sacrifice. God told me to do it. And whatever this is doing for your heart, whatever it's doing to heal your brain and your mind to understand how to allow people to help you because you've always been someone that helps everybody else to be that person that can receive help, then let that be healed. So the, 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 I understand the process. But yes, imposter syndrome is, is true. It's, it's a real thing. But that's what God is trying to heal you from. And another person, another thing that's amazing about you is that you actually go to therapy. You know what I'm saying? That you understand the, the, the problems that you have. You go, I got to get this fixed. I'm going to work on it. And so that's what I'm saying. It's still a doing. It's still, you're still in the process. You're still in process. So that's the beautiful thing about it. And I'm telling you, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's there every step of the way. Every time you're questioning him, he's like, yeah, I'm still here. Keep living. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm figuring it out. Hey, just keep here. I'm going to give you this booking over here that's going to bring some money in your, your, your bank account. Hey, I'm going to open this door up for you. Just keep on moving. Keep on moving. And if you can keep waking up in the morning, you've done a whole lot more than people who have decided to kill themselves because they said they never want to wake up again. That's why you got to celebrate moments like that to be like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm a, like you said, I was coming every time I come to do a taping, I feel this way. At least you came. Cause you could say the terrorist, this ain't doing nothing. This ain't, this ain't really what I want to be. Uh, I'm going I'm to throw in a towel. Then you make me feel now I get mad. I like, so now you really wasted my time because that means that you gave up on you and didn't give me an opportunity to even have a say so about it. So then I literally just wasted my time. So, so, that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's just in the doing. Keep doing it. Keep waking up. Keep doing. And and these stories that have been told, I get so much out of it while I'm while I'm while I'm shooting it. I'm going, wow, this is amazing. They went through this. They overcame this. This girl right here uh, um, was selling drugs, and now she owns a huge trucking business. Like, oh my, like that stuff is. The stories are rewarding to me. Those stories, and this is what people understand. They need to go back and watch a lot of these episodes. If you ever want a college degree in whatever it is, go watch some of these stories because these people earned that degree in life by learning certain stuff and entrepreneurship that they are becoming extremely successful in it. So that's the stuff I like. You know, when you talk about a bunch of celebrities telling how they did it, that's cute. But I like to see little Ray Ray talk about, no, nah, listen, this, this is how I did it. And you're like, what? You did what? And you still look like that, still live like that in the hood? And I can see you at Walmart. And I'm doing real well. You know what I'm saying? And, and even well is relevant to certain people. Certain people are just doing better than their family was, and that's success. Some people ain't making a whole bunch of money, but they're thriving and causing impact, changing people's lives. That's success. So I get a lot, a lot out of these episodes. That's rewarding to me. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying at the end of the day, knowing that even the opportunities that you're providing for other people that who sit on these uh, in this chair – 
that's doing something for them. It's people that, I, that you interview, they say, oh, my God, I've always wanted to be interviewed by you. That opportunity didn't present itself on K104, but now you have the power and the control to give them their dream, and you gave it to them. And they like, oh, my God, there's people coming in like, I'm being interviewed by Lady J. You know what I'm saying? Like, you a rock star in these people's minds. So you you just like, yeah, but I ain't got a large numbers, and I, my podcast ain't this. And they like, I don't give a dang about your numbers. You Lady J. Like, I don't give a dang. We can be interviewed. We, nobody ain't even got to see this. The fact that I can sit across from you is rewarding to me. That's what these people are saying. So at the end of the day, you got to understand that and be like, all right, God, whatever you want. And the minute that you submit to that, God's going to blow you up. You're going to look back and be like, what happened? Because it's in those stages that God is trying to wake us up, just like we heard at uh, the Survivor's Ball that he was fighting and bucking the system. And then once he actually submitted to that season and said, God said, this is what you wanted. This is what it is. I'm trying to teach you something. At that point, God could use him. You know what I'm saying? It's at that point that God is still massage you. Jay, I need you to wake up on this. Well, I feel this. I feel this. Shh, shh, shh. I need you to wake up on this. The minute you go, God, not my will. Let thy will be done. Let's go do this. He's going to be like, let's go. Man, why I put that post up yesterday? What post you put up? That scripture. You put what scripture? Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, Lord Just Jesus. yesterday. Because... And that's when God shows up. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you as sure as I sit here, you know my podcast, you know the real heart of what caused my podcast was people seeing the movie, but my podcast was birthed from brokenness, from me being at the lowest I've ever been in my life dealing with a woman that almost destroyed me. And God said, now I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to exalt you. But it took for me to be authentic. It wasn't me sitting around talking about, well, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just. It was me like, I'd be crying on my podcast. I'd just be real. God would be like, yes, I can use you. I can use realness every day. I can't use fakeness at all. And so that's what I'm saying that is going to happen for you. No, what is is it is happening for you because it's still in process. You're still going through it every time you show up and do an episode. Um, but, yeah, this is amazing. Um I encourage everybody to watch this whole season, the season before this. Watch the podcast, and you're going to grab a lot of nuggets. Uh, next season is going to blow your mind because God's intentionally bringing people on this podcast. It's going to change your life. It's going to encourage you. That's going to give you perspective about your own journey so that you can make the most out of your dash because that's what it's all about is the dash. That's it, guys. <laughs> I love you, girl. Let's close this out in prayer. Let's go and close this episode out with prayer. Oh. Since we got we we own this thing, Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for you just being God. People that are watching this podcast, God, I ask that you light a fire in their bosom. God, I ask that they begin to chase after those things that you called them to accomplish. God, I ask that you anoint the work of their hands. Lord, I thank you for the gifts that you've given each and every one of us. And God, I lift my sister up before you right now, God. Continue to heal, restore, deliver. Give her new insight and vision and confidence to, to walk this thing out that you've called her to walk out, God. God, we thank you. We thank you for everything that you're doing. God, continue to encourage us. Lord, we just thank you for you just being God. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for supporting the Dash podcast. I hope you uh you continue to be inspired. Love y'all. Thanks, Terrace. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the support. Make sure you subscribe to the Dash Podcast YouTube channel. Also, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. And feel free to share it with some family and friends. Thanks, guys.